delighted to introduce Dr. Keely Brooks, who's a lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. Hi, Keely. Hi, how are you? Congratulations, you're almost done. I know. And, and honestly, do you know what? This has flown by. It doesn't feel like 10 minutes since I sat down, I swear. I could easily do another three hours. Come on, bring it on. Just ring me up. We'll take questions for three hours. <laughs> um, and uh, also, uh, guest num researcher number 56, guest number 60 of the day, uh, Dr. Oh, come on, you would get me out with a tricky surname last. Um, <laughs> Have a go. Really? Uh, I'll murder it. Uh, Dr. Petra Prie Prietzi. Prietzi, almost correct. Prietzi. Almost correct. I've heard worse. <laughs> Dr. Petra Prietzi, who is an Alzheimer's, and quite fitting for the end of the day as well, but you are an Alzheimer's Research UK uh, postdoctoral research fellow at King's College. London. That's Hello right. both. Thank you. Hello and well you. done. Amazing achievement. Yes. Uh, honestly, it, as I say, it really has been easy and all the researchers I've spoken today have made it easy because you've all been so fantastic and sharing and very eloquent and it's easy to talk to people that are comfortable talking. There's been no awkward silences until now, unless you two are about to let me down. <laughs> Are you awkward? Am I going to have to ask loads of questions to fill this next 21 minutes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to try us. <laughs> uh, Keely, I'm going to come to you first. Um, so we're back to the, the hard times. You work in DNA extraction and genetic analysis, which uh, brains for dementia research. Again, do you know what? BDR has come up so many times today. Yeah, Tell it's a your... wonderful cohort. <laughs> <laughs> Please go on. Tell us about your work. Okay, so I've been working with the BDR for the last five years, and I've kind of been in charge of um, DNA extraction. So as they are collecting samples, both blood and brain, um, our lab has been uh, taking sections of those samples and using it for DNA extraction. And then we have been using that for genetic analysis. So we've been doing some whole genome sequencing, some exon sequencing, RNA sequencing, um, and some genotyping on um, the neurochip and doing what is now a very popular analysis called polygenic risk score, uh, trying to find the, ge the genes, the genetic variants that um, may be able to pr predict how likely you are to get Alzheimer's disease even as young as 30. And we've heard from several of the researchers today that actually we're now looking at prevention and the damage is occurring to the brain decades before the symptoms are showing. So we can find a, a simple, cheap way of identifying those at high risk. We can follow those up, maybe get them some interventions before the symptoms even start. So you're not just looking at the brains of people who've gone on to, you're looking at or every, or not just people who've gone on to develop uh, Alzheimer's? No, that is the beauty of the Brains for Dementia Research cohort. It's voluntary and we have um, a large number of um, controls um, and because we get the tissue post-mortem, um, we have um, neuropathology on all our samples. So we know the level of plaques, we know the level of tau, we have cognitive scores for them, we have diagnosis for them. So we have a large number of controls and super controls, if you like, where they have no amyloid or tau pathology. And then we've got um, really detailed pathology on people with Alzheimer's, but not just Alzheimer's. We've got Parkinson's, we've got FTD, we've got vascular, uh, Lewy body dementia. We've got numbers of everything. So it, it's a really nice new cohort. There's three, I think there's 3,200 people enrolled in it. Um, I have the DNA of about 1,200 people so far. So we've got 2,000 left to go, and I'm hoping that will get funding um, to continue that work. So this is connecting the DNA from people while they're still alive and... and uh, yeah, so some of these people are still alive, and I believe they are taking... Um, um, in, are they're involved in other studies um, to do with maybe diet, exercise, lifestyle, um, lifestyles, imaging. Um, and so the genetic data is available for that on the, well, it will be on the Dementia Platform UK. I'm hopefully getting it up there um, this month. So right. that the genetics, which can be the backbone of so many things and how the body responds to different things, people can actually get that data and put it into their analyses um, to hopefully try and fill the gaps. That's fantastic. So it's, it is actually the 
do you, do you actually work for the Brain Bank? Are you just their biggest fan? Um, no, I'm just there. Um, um, I was employed You're on. Of, uh... Yeah, I was employed as a postdoc on um, the out by the Alzheimer's Research UK for five years. This funding um, came to an end last year, or um, um, kind of. Um, but then I got um, a permanent job at um, Nottingham Trent as a lecturer, um, and I'm just aiming to carry on this work and um, keep it going, essentially. So do you, so do you mix lecture now? Are you just having to mix lecturing with the with your? You still get to go in the lab as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I have my small little lab, which I'm still trying to build up. Um, um, most of my um, samples and everything are still at University of Nottingham, which is where I was previously. So I'm in working in collaboration with um, Professor Kevin Morgan there, um, carrying on doing um, the DNA extractions and the genetic analysis, so we can have a really nice cohort with the data out there freely share, shareable to all the other researchers so that together, uh, collaborating, we can actually find some way forward. That, that, must, that sounds to me like quite a unique role. I can't imagine there are many people that are mixing those two things that you're doing. I mean, are the students you're lecturing also working in the same space? Um, not necessarily. I do have a couple of project students every year that do some of the, the bioinformatics for me, some of the analysis for me. Um, in the past, I've had students do, uh, PhD students do some of the, uh, the lab work with me. But um, yeah, I'm juggling both roles now. So that's uh, a that's lot of work. Challenging. <laughs> and Petra, so coming to you, coming uh, over to you, it, it, are you doing anything similar? Tell us about your work. Um, so th there are some similarities actually, and I'm really happy I'm here with Kelly, to be honest, uh, because we are we are using BDR a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. So my, I'm focusing on multi-omics predictors of Alzheimer's disease mainly, and I'm focusing on metabolites. So would you like me to elaborate a bit on metabolites, what they are? So metabolites, um, so they can sit on the skin as well, right? And Because I remember uh, there's a study published, was it a couple of years ago, where they can diagnose uh, Parkinson's from metabolites. From So they, uh, they are very small molecules. They're small molecules and they're present in, in every cell in your body. Yeah. And so usually uh, the, the type of metabolites we are in, interested in are lipids, for example, cholesterol, triglycerides, amino acids or vitamins. And um, they, they are very interesting because they are the final pro products of uh, biochemical reactions in your body. So they're uh, controlled, for example, they're affected by your genes and they're also uh, um, uh, by environmental influences, for example, your diet. So they are actually um, very near to what we call the phenotype. So what, what we actually see. So they can provide something like a snapshot of a, or a fingerprint of, of early um, dementia or what happens before dementia or during dementia. So I'm very interested in metabolites, especially those in blood because they're very easily accessible and uh, they're very relevant. For example, lipids are very relevant in and important in Alzheimer's pathology. And also because they are uh, potentially modifiable. So what we do is we, 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 we use um, Alzheimer's disease cohorts or we use uh, preclinical uh, um, um, population studies and investigate uh, whether metabolites or combinations of metabolites are associated with Alzheimer's disease or with cognitive decline in midlife. And then we try to see how they may interact with other types of uh, other biological layers, for example, your genes, your proteins. And then um, what I think that may have some overlap also with Kill's work is what we try to do is we try to use statistical approaches to, to um, tease out a bit cause and effect. So because an association does not necessarily mean causation. So we try to see are there any of these differences, differences we see in Alzheimer's disease, for example, are they because metabolites uh, sit in the causal pathway to Alzheimer's disease, or are they um, a, 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 a result of Alzheimer's disease? And then we try to use, again, statistical approaches such as polygenic risk schools or another approach called Mendelian randomization to try and dis disentangle this, because if you are to intervene, you must be sure that something sits on the causal pathway. Um, and also we are trying to see whether they also explain other things like uh, the association of established risk factors such as education, uh, would it be that because of your education, your diet is different and then you've got changes on your metabolite levels and then you may uh, have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so this is in a sort of nutshell what we're doing, but we are also now, we are moving a bit from blood, also looking at brain and we are using BDR, for example, um, um, to look at metabolites in the brain. 
and try to, uh, we, we want to embark on a study where we actually will be able to use the same individuals before and after, if possible, to see changes in metabolites during life and uh, in postmodern. Oh, well, so that was a good, that was one of the questions we're going to come back to, because uh, for people who are watching who aren't scientists, uh, it's come up so many times today about various tissues that you can and can't get from people that are alive. We've, we've talked to people using blood and uh, CSF and, um, but, and, and growing um, from stem cells from skin cells. But one of the underlying factors was um, the cells and things from the brain were quite hard to access. So metabolites are something you can gather, not you don't have to gather those post-mortem. No, 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 it would be, it would be post-mortem, yeah. Oh, it's still all, yeah. so all the metabolites you gather are always. So we, we 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 actually work with blood metabolites, and you can actually you can actually uh, have metabolites from uh, tissues from like iPS cells. So these are things people have started now using. But so far, our our uh, work is on postmortem brain tissue in terms of brain tissue. Yes. And, but but also from blood from living people and from blood from li mainly from blood from living people so yes which is very it's 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 a type of biomarker so this is very easy and uh, easily accessible and we've got local uh, data sets uh, at kings or uh, we collaborate with ucl and also uk biobank is um, about to provide a big um um you know data um platform of metabolites as well yeah, I mean, you can see how brains for because brains for dementia research collects blood from people while they're alive as part of their their regular data gathering before before. Yeah, I think it's every every couple of years, and they do cognitive tests as well. So they're following up people, so they can actually tell when the uh, when there's a decline in cognitive ability. Um, you know, if it happens, if if not. So what what are you hoping to find, Petra? What what will be the you know I mean what's what's going to be the exciting thing in the next year for you? What are you hoping to discover? So um, we've got lots of projects going on. Our um, uh, so what we are working on is try to find to establish um, a list of metabolites which are associated both with Alzheimer's disease or with cognition in um, midlife. And then what we try to actually establish is whether they are actually on the causal pathway. So if they are on the causal pathway, this means that in the future intervening on these metabolites may have downstream effects on Alzheimer's disease. So that's what we are at, we are at now. We are trying to establish, we're trying to using different cohorts to find, to, to uh, refine our list and then try to understand whether, uh, how they sit on the causal pathway. So this is, so, thinking right back to what Chris said at the start, thinking about causal pathway. So we're talking about the, this, this pathway of somebody that there's a point when somebody goes on and that risk factor becomes higher and then they're gonna go on to develop a, a dementia of some kind. And so trying to get these metabolites or early on, I guess, so you can understand what, what they're telling you is that I... It, it, yes, yes. So uh, one of the things we're doing is try to get them early on. So we are investigating them in middle life. So try to see. And then because we've got a population studies where uh, uh, individuals have been followed up for a number of years. So we can see whether they're associated with later on um, dementia or cognitive decline, but also because of uh, the use of uh, big genetic studies and big metabolite studies as well. We can actually use some statistical approaches which can tell us um, um, in a sort of in, it's in, a, in, in a sort of mathematical model, whether metabolites are actually causally, causally associated with Alzheimer's disease. So in, in that scenario, you don't necessarily need a longitudinal study. You can just have a, a case control study. So I'm just trying to think about how some of the questions came out. So other people earlier have explained how microglia were cells that were swimming around in the fluid of the brain and they were going to eat up the bad bits and how the protein collect you know gathered in certain ways and we've had those things explained to us can you explain to us what where a metabolite sits within that is this is a metabolite a part of that cell or is this something else that's going on in the brain well, it depends on the yes so it depends on the uh, metabolite so for example you've got different lipids such as fingomyelins, you've got uh, uh, ceramides. So some of the lipids are part of the membrane. So it actually really depends on when they are. And we know, for example, that uh, there are some uh, uh, genes which are associated near, they, they are sensing these metabolites and they're interacting with these metabolites. That, that's perfect. That's what I wanted to get 
from you there was about the lipids and I think people will under, understand that as, as well. We have actually got a couple of questions. So I'm, we, that's perfect timing for this question that's just come in from Chris, which says, uh, given metabolites and lipids research, do you think that there may be more targeted nutritional or uh, uh, nutrate uh, um, interventions for dementia? Can you I see think, the question as well? I think potentially, yes. I, it's, it's quite complicated, but we, we do see a lot of associations from the studies we have between metabolites and different nutrients. So this is something definitely that, that is very possible and something we are investigating actively. He asked about neurocortical, sorry, neurocortical intervention um, for prevention or otherwise. Um, so, so I'm going to come back to you, Keely. You were talking earlier about your labs just getting going. So what, what, are, your, what are your hopes for the coming for the coming 12 months. What, have you been affected by COVID as well? Are you gonna, are you managing to get going? Uh, COVID's affected me a little bit because I had a little bit of lab work that I was just in the middle of doing when it all hit. Um, but I'm, I'm hopefully gonna get access to the lab soon just to finish that off. Um, and then it's a lot of data analysis. So one of the problems with uh, the polygenic risk or in genetics is a lot of my colleagues have been doing similar things but we've been using different cohorts we've been using different base sets different uh, dna variants and so consistency in the actual variants that are used to generate these models um, is very poor um, and so if we're going to ever get a workable test that people can use um, we need to find consistency and Having that consistency not only allows us to have a reliable test, it would also help us work out the pathways that are involved in Alzheimer's disease so we can have more of a personalized medicine approach. So that's what I'm aiming to do in the next six to 12 months is a lot of data analysis and, and messing around and trying to find um, some consistencies between all the data sets, um, similar to what Petra was doing with her metabolites essentially, because consistency is the only way forward we're gonna get um, a handle on this situation really. It's interesting isn't it because I mean there are lots of people have talked today about the various data sets that they're using. I mean it's great I think we've heard about Brains for Dementia Research talked about a lot, we've talked about the biobanks, we've did Dementia's Platform UK has come up several times as well um, that these uh, data sets exist out there but so how do you, I mean how do we go about improving consistency across these um, I actually think we have to be a lot more um, willing to share our data and our models. I think there is a lot of, well, we don't want to share anything until we've published it, um, which is kind of understandable. But I think really we're going to have to start teaming up and sharing our data, sharing our models um, and working together. Personally, I think that working together is really going to be the answer and also across disciplines. So it's not just a geneticist working together, it's say like me and Petra working together. So like you've got a, something consistent in your metabolites, then we need to look at the maybe the genetic backbone and go, oh yeah, all those genes are the same variants. So that could be why your metabolites are showing that. And it's bridging the gap from the genetic risk all the way to the phenotype. Uh, yeah, I mean, bringing to, I mean, that's, that again, has come up, I suppose that's where, organizations like the Dementia Research Institute that's been talked about a few times are, I guess, trying to bring different labs and different organizations together 